All right. Hey, everyone. Now, welcome back to Know Who Drives Return by Boardroom Alpha. I'm David Dropkin with Joanna Macris. Uh, and today, it's our pleasure to, to be joined by Dee Chalby, who's the CEO and founder of Moneyline. Uh, Moneyline recently went public uh, via SPAC last year, Fusion Acquisition Corp, closed in September. Um, and he's helping us uh, kick off a, a series of, of CEOs with Dee SPAC companies, if you will. So, Dee, hey, thanks a lot. Congrats on, on the listing and, and thanks for hopping on today. Great. Thanks for having me. Cool. So just to, how about to kick things off? Uh, I understand you're a recovering banker, so uh, could you get a little bit of you know career background, sort of what led you to to the founding of Moneyline? Yeah, look, uh, you know, I started spent the 2000s in the investment banks. I was at Goldman, um, spent some time at Citadel, where um, in 2008, 2009, um, Citadel and Ken Griffin were trying to create an investment bank. So I was on the founding team of that. Um, and then right around, uh, right after that, really, really realized that, um, you know, the money center banks were on the sidelines and we had a once in a lifetime opportunity to open up the hood of financial services and go compete directly with, um, with banks on uh, direct to consumer products. The banks were distracted. They had the U.S. Treasury as a shareholder um, and a lot of the innovation that they would usually drive was yielded to Silicon Valley and upstarts like ourselves. And, you know, uh, we started the business in 2013 on that insight that um, there was going to be at least five to 10 years where the banks would be a little bit on the sidelines and you could go attract consumers on um, at that point, nascent platforms for, from an advertising perspective, Facebook, of course, it became a behemoth afterwards. Um, but it was actually, you know, we were acquiring customers for four to $10 in 2013. Mm -hmm. And that led to an opportunity of really creating a customer centric platform. Um, but, you know, seriously, you know, learn the chops through seeing the, evolution of consumer finance through the 2000s, the credit crisis, and then, you know, the dislocation that, you know, hardworking Americans felt when banks were all of a sudden pulling credit lines and um, they're not offering mortgages or, or credit cards. It was an opportunity really to use the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning to go build something unique, um, putting the customer at the center as opposed to, you know, putting a um, sort of the bank's unit economics at the center. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you've, you've exhibited some pretty uh, yeah. impressive user growth early on here, I would say. Um, you know, to what do you, do you attribute that, that success of being able to grow, grow the user base of, of Moneyline so quickly? Yeah, look, and we, we saw, uh, we've always been a tech first, data first company. So for, for the first many years of our life, uh, lifetime, we were predominantly focused on building one piece of technology that's part bank, part um, uh, investment management, robo-advisor, part lender, part advisor. But we saw it resonate a lot in the pandemic. Because I think if you take a step back and you look at what's happening to the, to this, to, to the labor force right now, 30% of Americans are working multiple jobs, gig, right? So if you're working, if you're getting two W-2s or if you're getting, you know, a W-2 and multiple 1099s, driving Uber, substitute teaching, you know, doing freelance work, uh, the banks have a really hard time, the money center banks have a really hard time underwriting that consumer. Moneyline, because we're so algorithm-based, algorithm we're able to ingest income streams from multiple different income, uh, income sources, jobs, right? And say that, hey, this person is making $70,000 a year or $80,000 or $100,000 a year, whereas the bank may only give them uh, credit for earning twenty dollars or $30,000 a year. So the financial products that they're able to make available to them um, are, it, it, I mean, they put themselves in a disadvantaged position. We're then, we're instead able to go out to our customers and say, hey, we've got a credit offer for you. We've got, you know, investment management tailored for how you get paid in a way that resonates with the changes in the labor force. So we saw a step function increase in the usability of our product through the pandemic. Well, while the banks were retreating and we, you know, history repeats, repeats itself, we saw this happen in 09 and 2010, which created the opportunity for Moneyline to exist. And then we saw it again in 2020 and 2021, which allowed the opportunity for Moneyline to hit escape velocity. Mm -hmm. So those ARPU numbers that you talk about, that growth, I think it's from 55 to 155 off of your existing customer base. Walk us through the dynamics and the flow of, of how um, the incremental apps are additive to those numbers. Yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, uh, we have historically always taken a platform approach. It wasn't always the most popular opinion. You know, when we were raising from venture capital, one of the feedback used to be that, hey, look, you got you have to focus on one transaction. And we said, look, you know, our insight is that the American household goes through 10 months of 
excess and two to three months of deficit every year. Mm -hmm. So you need to have products that are both on the asset side and the liability side. So inherently our product was built to allow investing in those 10 months and then borrowing in those two months against the behavior that you've accumulated in those 10 months. So it was meant to be used for, um, for investing on a micro basis, whether it's roundups, whether it's auto invest, and it was meant to be able to borrow from yourself because you know instead of having collateral in the form of assets, we gave credit to our customers for having collateral in the sense of behavior, right? So um, inherently, the platform was built for people to use two of our products. And what we see there is you know, that ARPU of $55, if you just take our users and our revenue, it's a, it's a simple division. Um, it, it's really comprised of transaction fees um, where you know, consumers are paying us to access their uh, funds instantly. It's comprised of merchant funded interchange. So this is, these are fees that uh, consumers aren't paying, but the merchants are paying. And it's uh, you know, comprised of affiliate fees. So if we're able to give uh, our consumers great experience with banking and investing and roundups and crypto, um, we believe that we create a great relationship with them that when they need a mortgage or an insurance product or a credit card or not a loan, they come to Moneyline to discover what is the right product for me at this moment in time with the way that I'm earning. And that's really what brings the ARPU um, uh, higher over, over time. So the, so the 155 number that we show, that's over a cohort. That's when that user has kind of stayed with us for a year um, and they start using um, the second you know, financial account for us. So do they start by using basic checking account services and then add on from there? I mean, how does that evolution work? Yeah. So look, I mean, I think, you know, we are hyper personalized financial recommendations. So that's the product we give to consumers. Hey, link your third party bank account with Plaid or Finicity and we'll give you a lot of insights. So once we've given them that feedback, what we see is that they start off with, hey, this is pretty interesting. Let me open a Moneyline or Money Bank account. Um, to start that conversation. And that's a very popular high velocity product. Um, and then based on our understanding of the user, we'll recommend, hey, you really ought to turn on roundups. And roundups are simple, you know, they exist in the market. Every time you swipe your, for coffee, you can buy Bitcoin as well for 17 cents or a dollar at a time. And that's one, those, those are two of our most popular uh, uh, features with the highest velocity. And then we have things on the credit side like Instacash, which is uh, a salary advance product. We have a credit building membership um, and we have a whole plethora of financial products that are available through Bunnyline uh, from, from, from our 900 or so partners um, through, our, uh, through, our, uh, through our network. And what do you see as kind of the target customer base? I mean, is it kind of a younger demographic? Mm -hmm. How is that evolving over time? Yeah, I mean, it's evolving um, as we speak. Historically, it's been the $40,000 to $150,000 household. Um, so think about any household that's eligible for the child tax credit. That's, a, that's part of Moneyline's target addressable market. Um, our company now, with some of the acquisitions we've made, have seen 125 million discrete Americans come through our systems. So it is intentionally mass market in terms of the, uh, the products we're able to offer. Um, but as we speak, we are realizing that, um, you know, historically our demographics were more 30, 34 to 45, mm -hmm. um, which is usually a little bit older than what you'd see with fintechs, but we're starting now to go younger. We're, we're starting to see 18 to 24 is now really resonate with the product because we're doing things like peer to peer and roundup and content. Um, you know, ultimately we want to be the destination where you learn about, um, you know, financial advice, you know, if you, if you download the app and you look at it, you know, we'll talk to you about conquering your taxes, 401ks, 529as. No one really gets taught these things. Um, <laughs> so even if you don't want to open a financial account with us, you can download the app for free and discover and explore. And as we, as we made the change to discover and explore, as opposed to, hey, we're going to, you know, uh, stuff a bank account down your throat, we realized that we were able to increase the aperture to a completely different user segment that's now using it for financial advice and literacy. Um, they're still opening accounts, but they may not be doing it, doing that as the first thing that they do, but rather the second or third thing that they do. And that's been an interesting shift over the last uh, couple of months and couple of quarters. I love, I love when the younger generation always jokes that, that those are the things you should be learning in school, right? Um, right. So are you worried at all about, um, and how do you think about some of the bigger banks and the, the incumbents? starting to roll out some of the similar low cost features or, or perks that, you know, fintechs like mm -hmm. yourself um, have sort of, you know, been built upon. 
Yeah, if your business is built on interchange, if your business is built on, hey, um, we're going to have this arbitrage because we're partnering with the bank to have a little bit higher spread on interchange, that's not sustainable, in my opinion, because ultimately Chase and Wells and Capital One and many of these other kind of money center banks will, you know, either give that away or it'll, they'll, they'll make it hard to, um, to, to really kind of have that as your business model. Mm-hmm. So we've made the decision to be in the in sort of the financial advice, financial literacy sphere, where we're um, we're still doing hyper personalized finance better than anyone, right? So for you specifically, what is the exact amount of insurance you ought to have? The exact amount of you know uh, you know mortgage or um, you know savings amounts? Like we can say, hey, here's your safe to spend today. You're safe to invest today. And that requires you to be a data company. So we're structured as a data company. We've seen 40 million Americans come through us. Uh, we've, we've recently acquired a company that has 125 million records. Um, so our ability to aggregate that data and use the power of the community to play back what the optimal next step is still is industry leading. And that's where we believe that we're going to have a lot of expansion of users choosing to use Moneyline as opposed to you know, just relying on two-day early paycheck. That is highly commoditized. I completely agree with you, right? Uh, a lot of folks can build, you know, roundups. A lot of people can build um, the debit card account um, with the proliferation of banking as a service. In fact, you know, you'll, you'll start seeing a lot of fintechs that are now uh, verticalized. Mm-hmm. They're for specific um, segments or for specific inf- affinity groups. Um, there's a mil- for, 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 you know, various, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, religious groups or what have you, right? But the fact of the matter is, um, you know, Moneyline is intentionally a mass market because we play in that advice uh, sphere about about talking to users about what next to do with their financial lives. Mm-hmm. Right. And where do you see PayPal in the mix here? I mean, they're offering more fintech-like services. Um, yeah, look, I mean, PayPal is the OG right there. Uh, they are uh, the probably the largest. Um, they are probably the largest uh, digital bank out there. Um, and, you know, I think they, they have a very specific, um, you know, checkout, merchant checkout um, feature that works. But what you realize is that you have to, you know, again, I, I go back to the advice layer, that you have to be able to converse with consumers and kind of uh, help them about what to do next. And that's where we play. And that's where we see um, the gap, sort of, sort of gap in the market that we fill. There seem to be just there seems to be a lot of noise in this space and a lot of companies, you know, want to be kind of the finance super app. So, you know, you're in a sea of companies um, and differentiating, you know, where do you see, you know, kind of how you have the edge and and what do you think is going to define the space? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, there are lots of super apps, but, you know, we're playing um, a, a different strategy, right? And I think one, our strategy is one of the most interesting ones. We recently acquired a media company. Um, so we now can create our own content. We have a thousand creators that are athletes, celebrities, influencers. Um, and that's, you know, a, a lot of people didn't understand why we acquired that company because it wasn't traditionally what a challenger bank, new bank, fintech company would do. But what it allows us to do is it really allows us to own an authentic conversation about the culture of money. It allows us to um, engage with segments of the population um, that haven't really been taught about financial services in the right way or in a, um, or, or in, in, a, in a thorough way. Um, so it allows us to acquire those consumers as, as listeners to our, our conversation in a way that's uh, highly differentiated. Not a lot of people are acquiring customers like that. But more importantly, we're then able to contextualize financial decisions in terms of real life. Instead of showing them a personal loan offer, we're having we're creating content around a series about how to you know, slash your student debt, mm-hmm. how to, um, you know, buy your first house, how to buy your first car, or how to make decisions around leasing and buying, um, all in ways that consumers are really used to seeing the content like TikTok, like Instagram. So, you know, we joke around that we're becoming the TikTok of financial services where you're going to learn about each inflection point. Um, you know, we don't like that analogy, but it's easy to, easy to say and easy to explain. Um, and that's slightly different from how, how a bank um, really builds its assets and liabilities. Because of course, we understand that we're going to monetize our consumers through financial products, but the, the reason to come and the reason to stay is content. We also bought a second company, even financial, that, which closed just last week. And with them, we now have the ability to offer in a native manner 
um, a plethora of mortgage, insurance, credit card, auto loan uh, products directly to consumers. So we become the destination to discover um, you know, what I should be doing next in the context of all this content that we're creating. Um, so our ability to then match them with our first party products and third party products is really the differentiator and the superpower there. It'd be uh, better to learn uh, financial advice on TikTok from, from you guys and some you know, <laughs> random teenager, you know, pumping uh, stocks or NFTs, right? Um, but on that, uh, any, any plans uh, in the future, you know, we've seen a bunch of fintechs, you know, sort of go out and get their own bank charters um, become a bank. Any plans to do that in, in the future? Or will you maintain you know, a bank partnership for, for, for the time being? Yeah, look, for the time being, you know, uh, we like our bank partners. We, we're highly regulated. Um, we're broker dealer, FINRA, um, we're SEC regulated as well. Um, so, you know, we continue to think that the bank partnership works for us. It allows us to grow fast um, and it allows us to offer flexible and nimble products over time, um, you know, as, as sort of uh, the regulators catch up on national charters and national licenses. We'll always keep an eye towards that. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, uh, the business model works really well with the way it is. Right. Um, you know, obviously, a lot of a lot of talk and chatter this year about you know the rising rate environment, right? So banks are predicting anywhere from three, four, five up to seven rate hikes. Uh, how, how does uh, how does money lines business uh, get affected um, if rates do rise, you know, more than expected? Yeah, so you know, in a traditional way, um, from from traditional banks, we are insulated. Um, a lot of our warehouse facilities that we use to finance the originations on our balance uh, originations to our, our members are all fixed rate, so they've already been um, kind of fixed last year, if you will. Um, our consumers, I think the, the, probably the, the more relevant question is how do, how do our consumers react in a rising rate environment? You know, um, the American consumer is in a strong position right now. They just had two years of stimulus, which positioned them well. The labor market has is, is really hot as we speak. Um, you know, labor force participation is probably um, still not as high as it was pre-pandemic. So what that tells you, it tells us is that of course there are, you know, jobs available for folks that want it there. You, know, you can upscale and get a higher paying job relatively easy. Um, so we see a, a benign consumer right now for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, rate increases sometimes, um, you know, precipitate recessions. That's something that we're looking out for. You know, will unemployment increase? Will will um, you know? Will demand go to levels where um, really you know uh, companies are shedding workforce? Mm -hmm. We don't see that happening right now because again, you know, there's lots of artificial elements to inflation as well right now, which which is a supply chain. Um, so everything that we see from the underlying data, the American consumer that interacts with MoneyLine seems uh, relatively healthy. Uh your guidance, I think, for this year doesn't include anything associated with the crypto platform or the buy now, pay later. So talk to us. It sounds like the crypto offering has had some pretty fast success. Uh, so just update us on that and how it's going. Yeah, so we'll be providing guidance on uh, March 10th. Um, so we're excited to talk about how all of it fits together, um, especially with the two acquisitions. But as expected, um, you know, there's a the crypto is part of the zeitgeist right now. It's a way for consumers to really understand where it may be in five years from now. So we play a small role there in uh, allowing our consumers to round up into crypto. That's been an incredibly popular product with high velocity, and we expect that to continue from a demand perspective. We're opening a lot of crypto accounts. So we'll, we'll talk specifics in a few weeks here, um, but um, everything that we all the assumptions that went in, 87% of Americans have never touched crypto when we started building the product. Um, and you can expect us to really incorporate that into peer-to-peer, -peer, incorporate that in other ways to think of crypto. Um, and, and we limit it, we limit the coins. Um, and we do that um, as a way to just um, really go deep in the education process around Bitcoin, Ethereum, a couple of other coins. Um, we'll be pretty, um, if you want to trade the 40th altcoin, we're not the platform. Um, but we believe that for um, our user base, the hardworking Americans, middle class, um, this is the best way to get exposure because it, whether the price is 65000 or 35000 um, you're buying every day with your coffee. 
and that's a great way to dollar cost average. It's a great introduction to the, to the asset class um, and a good way to compound over time. And have you put any numbers around the buy now, pay later offering and what that could add? Um, we, ha we have not provided guidance on that, but um, one of the updates there is, look, we just acquired uh, Even Financial, where there are 400 um, you know, partners there, hundreds of lenders are on that platform. Um, so we'll think of buy now, pay later in a way where a lot of those lenders can participate. And um, you know, it'll be a pretty interesting uh, rollout. Um, it's in beta right now. Um, it'll be a pretty interesting rollout um, as we um, you know, start getting some uh, integration with even financial here. Um, yeah, and I know, I know it's early days uh, since the DSPAC, but uh, you know, your stock price along with some of your peers is obviously you know, taking a bit of a hit. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on sort of how, or maybe what the market's getting wrong um, in, in terms of you know, evaluating you guys as a company in, in such a, you know, a short period of time since actually have been, you know, been public? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, um, you know, we're, we're all scratching our heads, of course, um, in terms of the, the violence with which um, tech stocks have sold off mm -hmm. over the last three or four months. Um, you know, a lot of technicals are involved in that, right? I mean, there's leverage in the system. Um, but even if you think about rising rates and, and its impact on the, on the discount rate, it still implies a 15 or 20% correction, not a 50 to 80% correction. Um, you know, we're still uh, we're still rotating the natural holders of our um, of, of our stock. So we priced uh, Moneyline ticker ML, the old Merrill Lynch ticker, a year ago uh, on February 12th, right of 2021. Yeah, and um, we had 76 million dollars of last 12 months of revenue. We ended last year. If you just take our publicly stated numbers for the three businesses, it was a 230 billion dollar LTM business. Um, and we were, you know, we're not trading it. We're massively sold off from our uh, IPO price. So clearly, there's a dislocation um, in the markets in terms of um, the the investors that were trading the SPAC were very SPAC driven investors who had technicals of you know the SPAC product that they were trading. Um, so as we de SPAC'd, um, those investors ro are, are rotating out. So we're at a point now where all of those investors are out of the stock. And now we're rebuilding the book with natural uh, growth and value in uh, fin uh, fintech technology, financial services investors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and look, if you look at the fundamentals of our business, the product market fit, the, um, the, the strength of our balance sheet, um, you know, this is a great entry point to the money line story. And, you know, we've all seen this movie before where these big drawdowns create awesome opportunities. And, um, you know, as soon as, management and board, we can buy in a window, we will. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of conviction on our strategy. I think it's one of the, one of the most interesting strategies in FinTech. And we, we have, um, you know, for better or for worse and fairly been tagged as a DSPAC, which has a, a stigma. Um, we do have our profitability in 2023. So that's another kind of piece of feedback that, hey, in this environment, we, we want you to be profitable. We'll announce in a couple of weeks that we've, we've made a lot of strides and steps to to, to get to that level of end state faster. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one of the things with this management team is we've been, you know, uh, we have a lot of levers. Um, you know, Rick Korea, our CFO, he um, spent eight years at Citadel where he was managing a $65 billion asset portfolio. So we have seen volatility in our prior lives. We know how to manage through this process. Um, and, and we frankly, you know, in a way like it because we get sort of comp that with today's stock price and there's opportunities to, of course, you know, be, uh, greedy when other, others are fearful, but at the yeah. same time, you know, I think it is um, a testament to, you know, um, the wars we're seeing in Europe and sort of the dislocations we're seeing broadly with inflation and rotation out of tech. Yeah. And again, you're not alone, you're not alone there in that, uh, you know, we obviously follow the stock market pretty closely over yeah. here, but these back stigma is kind of uh, nearly universal, I would say, um, to, to, to a lot of the companies that chose that route last year. Um, so yeah, you find an opportunity. It's a it's a good good point to to hop in. Um, so how can we think about um, you know you guys and and you know, differentiation with some of the other you know, newly public peers out there like a, a Dave or SoFi or? Yeah, look, I think uh, 
you know, we're, we're in the business of the, all of those folks are our friends and we participate in the same industry. Um, you know, there are some that are more bank-like. There are some that have higher duration credit products and they need to be a bank and they need to, uh, they, they, need, they have reliance on cheaper cost of deposits. Um, and then there are others that are much more transactional fee oriented, right? So if you look at Moneyline, um, we've created a highly diversified revenue stream. Um, we have part of our business that's B2B. We have part of our business that's creating content. And we have the, the, the core business as a direct-to-consumer diversified digital fintech, challenger mm -hmm. bank, however you want to call it. So the diversification of the, that revenue stream is pretty strong. On our, on, our, on our fintech strategy, 90% of, our, of the users that use it are, um, are returning customers and our new customers are growing. So, so, so the growth rate is compounding. We're going to continue showing very healthy growth rate throughout 2022 um, while you know, really running the business towards profitability. And I think that's a pretty special story. Um, you know, we're positioned better than most to be in the hands of 15 to 20 million Americans because of the approach that we're taking that, hey, come download Moneyline for financial literacy, some fun. And if you want to open a bank account and an investment account and round up and you know, earn rewards on crypto, great. But come in, tell your friends, use this for peer-to-peer, -peer, use this for buy now, pay later. Um, it's intentionally mass market, right. whereas others have picked you know, a certain segment of you know, uh, whether it's Henry's or whether it's subprime, you know, Moneyline uh, is misunderstood in the market if it's only being seen as a subprime digital bank. I think mm -hmm. the ambitions that we have to be in the hands of millions, um, I, I don't think people will believe us until we show and we have a lot of confidence to show. So, um, you know, as we show more of that through uh, execution, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully catch some eyes over, over the course of the year. Right. Do you think you could comment a little bit on some of the civil litigation that's going on? Obviously, being in the consumer lending business is probably par for the course, but to the extent that that's a headline risk on the stock, I'd love for you to comment. Yeah, I look, I mean, I think that there's, uh, as you said, in financial services, it's always par for the course. Um, you know, we're, we, of course, have good relationship with the regulators. Um, we cooperate with them. They have questions about our businesses. We, uh, we answer those questions about our businesses. We, we collaborate, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're creating so much value for our customers. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're bundling, um, we're creating credit building memberships. Um, you know, 60% of our members are increasing their credit scores by 40 points. We're the first investment account for 92% of our uh, millions of users. Um, so the amount of, you know, good that we're doing on, around financial literacy, financial access, financial inclusion, um, at the end of the day is getting really interesting superpowers into the hands of those that were previously left out. And that's why we say we're, we're the private bank for the hardworking um, uh, middle class, hardworking Americans creating financial access and, uh, and rewiring the banking system. We, we categorically believe in that. Anyone who sits in money line believes in that. Um, and, for the, uh, and, and every time we talk to regulators, they also once they get into the numbers and once they, once they get into the impact, they realize how powerful the platform is. So we have uh, all the confidence that all of those conversations that we have with regulators um, will end in copacetic uh, fashion. Uh, and, and a fun one for me, I know uh, he, he was your sponsor last year, but uh, you're still happy that Austin Sindrick took home uh, the Daytona 500 this past weekend. <laughs> oh my God, that was so exciting for us. We were his first uh, major sponsor um, going back to 2019 and, you know, I've spent some time with Austin over the years and what a wonderful story and what a wonderful kid. Um, it, we, we, we switched jersey, jerseys to back Bubba Wallace this year and he eked out Bubba in the win at Daytona. Uh -huh. So we were cheering them both on, uh, both of them are, are young lions and I uh, couldn't be more proud of both of them. Yeah. It's it was ex definitely an exciting race and yeah. Bubba was obviously, uh, immensely popular and, and great racer. So looking forward to see, uh, the money line Toyota, Toyota, Toyota out there this year. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Well, Hey D, you know, really appreciate uh, you taking the time, to tell your story, uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on. So we're, you know, we're excited to, to, to follow, follow going forward. Any, uh, any last words of wisdom? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that uh, it's probably better to ignore the tape for a couple of months here. Um, you know, we're going to be showing some good execution over the course of the year and, Again, like I said before, it's a great entry point into the Moneyline story. Awesome. Well, appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks, guys.
Appreciate it.